Can you record share screen? It's not even showing that. You guys can see the PowerPoint. So today we're going to be talking about other ways to measure individual molecules, but using different phenomenon from fluorescence. So using nanopores that are based on electrical currents, using magnetic fields, and using light in a way to exert force on particles with optical traps. So this is going to be like the main thing that we'll discuss at length. Um, a little bit about nanopores as well. Um, so the goals for this lecture is, like I said on the first slide, using electric, electrical currents, magnetic fields, and force to measure single molecules. So you should be familiar with optical traps, magnetic traps, nanopores, and we'll talk about an able trap, which is electrokinetic trapping. Um, we'll also talk about atomic force microscopy and spect spectroscopy as well. Um, and since we're shifting away from using um, light microscopy, and there's a lot of discussion of force in this lecture, we're going to go over what are the length scales or what are the, not the length scales, see, I'm like too obsessed with microscopy. The scales of force in biology. Um, and how can force be used for imaging is with AFM. Um, and similarly, force for imaging, but also we can use tunneling, so We're going to briefly highlight scan and tunneling microscopy as well. Um, so with our diagram of our instruments, if we're focusing on the force methods, our source is actually going to be physical contact with the sample. And this is for like atomic force microscopy in the optical trap or the magnetic traps. Um, our sample is going to be single biomolecules or biopolymers. When we're going over some of these methods, you can see that biopolymers are desirable because of their length that you can um, that it's conductive, conducive for these types of instrumentation. And the detector is actually, there is still optics and light involved. Um, so an optical readout to infer distance information. So there's still some optics involved, but not for the source of the sample, just as the detector to be able to infer that distance. Um, so th this is specifically for force methods, but we are talking about quite a range of instruments in this lecture. Um, so I want to start out by first talking about using electrical signals for measuring single molecules. And this is, um, we're going to be focusing on solid state nanopores. And you're measuring an electrical current as molecules pass through a pore, a very small pore. So the first thing is how can we make nano-sized pores? And when we're talking about solid state 
nanopores. This is typically done by focused ion beam etching. And that's what this figure in the lower left is showing. So this is typically done in an electron microscope where your substrate here, it's typically a silicon nitride type substrate. And you can focus your electrons to a very small spot that can actually start to etch and remove materials away. So the benefit of using focus ion beam is the length scale, the spatial scale that you can get at, so you can get actual nanopores. So that's what's being shown, the process over here, that um, with different layering, if you're familiar with nanofabrication or microfabrication, being able to etch away, you can see the focus ion beam milling here removes away a lot of the material. And then using uh, different light, you can fill this pore with different materials, but many times it's just used um, in an empty way. And you might, you would remove this glass substrate here so molecules can pass through. So these are electron microscopy images showing many nanopores over an entire chip. Zooming in, this length scale is 500 nanometers, and you can see the distant, like the pores actually passing through the material here. Um, so the benefit of focus ion beam etching is it's very reproducible. As you can see with these electron mic microscopy images. Other ways of forming nanopores include using graphene, since it's a single layer of carbon, you can have high sensitivity. And speeds. Since if you can think about the thickness of these pores, if it's like tens to hundreds of nanometers, what you're detecting when you're doing the measurement is everything that's in that pore. If you're at a single layer of carbon, you can get atomic resolutions. The drawback of using graphene is it's very fragile. So you can have some problems there. Uh, it's not as robust as the uh, focus ion beam imaging. Um, and also people use biological membrane proteins. in a supported lipid bilayer. Um, but again, these are more fragile. So those are, these are some alternatives, but the solid state nanopowers are what we're talking about with focus ion beam uh, etching. Um, so with these small pore sizes, if you're using solid state nanopowers, graphene or um, membrane-based methods, they all have the benefit that you have a small pore size that limits your measurement to one single molecule. And how this measurement is done is you apply a voltage difference on either side of the membrane or on either side of your nanopores. Um, And you measure the current difference as ions or your molecule of interest uh, flow through. And you'll see I put, I tried to write a lowercase i here. Um, and that's the convention in the nanopore field is using lowercase i for current that comes from the development of this method more from chemists as opposed to physicists, where physicists you typically use capital I, but either will work. So this figure here shows a schematic of what a nanopore measurement is, where you have electrodes on either side of your substrate here. You're typically measuring this in a buffer solution, so there's salt ions present that will be flowing through and have make creating a constant current. Um, but when you have your DNA molecule or your protein molecule flow through, that's going to change the current that's passing uh, 
that you're measuring. And over time, as it passes through, uh, you get different kerning. So this is a typical measurement for nanopores. And in electrochemistry, you'll see this special notation that they use. Instead of labeling their axes with, I guess, time points here, they instead typically use a scale bar type method where this Y is saying like, this is a current of 50 picoamps at this length and the time of five milliseconds. So that's a little bit different. Um, this figure here on the right is a zoomed in uh, portion of this current trajectory here. So when your sample, when your biopolymer enters, pore, enters a pore, um, it changes, you have a change in your current. Um, and the rate and degree of change will depend on the bio, uh, biopolymer structure. So the charge of the, bi the degree of the change, or the charge will affect the degree of the delta I that you see. So how large of a decrease in current do you see? Um, the size of your biopolymer will determine how long you see that change in current. So this has to do with like the time that you see that change in the current. So if you have a longer molecule that's passing through, it's gonna take more time to pass through the nanopore. So instead of seeing, uh, let's say here, if this is, we've measured a longer molecule, you would see a larger, this would be something that's short. The natural data here in blue, while in red, this would be a longer chain. And then it can also give information about the conformation with like the number of um, blips that you see. So over here in this trajectory, you see uh, multiple decreases. If they're spaced by a certain amount of time, that might tell you, okay, uh, this is a specific area of the conformation of your molecule that um, there might be different charges, different helical structures or beta sheets that are passing through versus like a random coil. And one of your homework, the problem set uh, questions gets at these points here. Um, in actual application of nanopores, I would say the most common that you see is DNA sequencing. Um, there's actually a commercial company called Oxford Nanopore that has chips. I guess it's a black box system, probably like this big half a sheet of paper that can connect to the USB um, and be used for sequencing. Okay. Okay, Austin's question is just to clarify, is the 50 picoamp scale the length of the largest peak or is it the scale still from top to bottom of the box? So the 50, so with these scales, this, the length of this line here is 50 picoamps. The length of this line here is five milliseconds. So these are similar to a scale bar in an image. That's what, um, this is how in electrochemistry uh, they label their axes here. Does that clarify, answer your question, Austin? Okay, good, good question. Um, it took me sitting through like several seminars where people talked about this to like understand what those meant. So I uh, wanted to point that out. Um, and I, okay. So yeah, DNA sequencing is commonly used. People will also use it for polymers, but not as frequently. Um, and the throughput for sequencing is like the problem here. And is what a lot of research is in nanopore science. Like, can we uh, 
increase that voltage difference so the molecules move through faster, but can we still resolve like what nucleotides are passing through um, is the challenge here uh, with the sequencing. Um, and also to give you guys a little bit of quantitative information about if you're trying to understand what this uh, change in current is, uh, an approximate equation that you'll see used is this, which I'll define all of these variables, um, where this is what you're detecting, your change in current. And A is your pore area. So the larger your pore, the larger that change in current is. Um, N is the induced charge density. So how charged is your molecule? Um, Q is the electron charge value. Mu is the ion mobility within your solution. Um, and then V over L is gonna be your electric field across the channel, across your pore in the Z direction, in the axial direction here. Um, so this, there's many different equations that are used. This one I like, depending on your sample, you can get more specific. But I do like this one that it has some general values that can be used for different types of molecules that you're using here. And this A and the V and the L are all about the geometry of your pore and is why people work with the focus ion beam versus the graphene, that based on how small of a current change you can detect, you, you can tune these um, values. Okay, so that's most of what I wanna talk about um, with nanopores, are there any questions with this? Okay, so now we can move on to measuring forces. Um, and um, with single molecule force methods, the goal is to be able to physically manipulate a sample. So you can measure the forces. Um, but you want to be able to convert and amplify that into a measurable signal. So that's what we're going to be going over, the different instrumentation that's being used to amplify and measure for signals. Um, but before we get into those methods, I want to discuss about the scales of forces um, in biology. That um, force can range greatly uh, in biology. Um, in the Lemke book, or Leak book, they give an example of whales diving. So I took a very Clevelandish picture of offline of the whale building on Route 2 and Route 90. Um, and if you have a blue whale diving and swimming, um, the amount of force that's going to be is about 10 to the 6 newtons. So that's like the large scale extreme versus when you're thinking at the molecular scale, if you're thinking about um, a molecular machine, like a myosin molecule carrying a cargo um, along microtubules, um, this would be 10 to the negative 12 newtons. So this is a molecular scale. This is like the organism scale, a large organism scale. So you can see that we have 18 orders of magnitude that force can range um, in biology. Um, it's also worth noting that forces due to gravity can be ignored at the molecular scale, at the biomolecular scale. since that's around 10 to the negative 17 newtons. Um, but when we're talking about single molecule measurements, we're typically working at the piconewton scale range. Um, 
And we can do a rough approximation of why it's piconewtons. Um, when you're working with uh, biomolecules, KVT is the energy range that we're thinking of in the cell in biology. So this would be four times 10 to the negative 21st joules. And if we're interested in molecular length scales, that would be a length scale of one nanometer or so. And if we do some dimensional, do some conversion of um, units or so, this would then be um, 10 to the negative 12 newtons. Um, or if we're working, if we're thinking about KVT at room temperature, RT is room temperature, that's a common, well, I guess that gets confusing with uh, some of the equations, I'll just write it down. That's about four piconewtons or so at around 300 Kelvin. Um, so 10 to the negative 12 newtons is a typical scale in, bio, in biophysics. Um, if we want to get into specific forces that are present in biology, we can talk about covalent bonds. And the forces for a carbon-carbon bond would be um, 10 to the negative ninth newtons, um, so nanonewtons. Um, but typically measurements and force measurements are looking at non-covalent forces. And these can include um, uh, we can talk about electrostatics, Van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonding, and hydrophobic interactions. So these typically range 10 to the negative 10th newtons, but it depends on the distance. So each of these non-covalent interactions will depend, um, have different distance dependence. Um, so electrostatics, our long range forces. And what equation, I'll ask you guys, it's a physics class, what, what equation um, describes the distance dependence of electrostatic forces? Yep, Todd says the Coulomb equation. So we've got our force is the charge squared, where your two different charges multiplied, four pi over the permittivity over r squared. So the fact that there's an r squared term here is what the long range force is here. here. Um, Van der Waals is a short range force. And what type of equation, someone's name, uh, is used to describe Van der Waals forces, or what potential? is used to describe Van der Waals forces. Any ideas? You can think back to being in Gen Chem, you might go over it. Something that looks like this. So that's the Leonard Jones potential is used to describe Van der Waals forces. So Leonard Jones, and that's an approximation, but it goes over, um, I guess the potential energy here would be A over one, two minus B over, so you can see here, the A and the B will depend on the specific sample um, of attractive and repulsive forces. You can see that R to the 12th, R to the 6th, and the denominator here is why it's a short range force. Um, hydrogen bonding is also short range, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 nanometers or so. And hydrophobic can be 
uh, longer range can be quite broad, but I would say up to around, it's gonna be less than or equal to around 20 nanometers or so. Um, so typically in force measurements, you're gonna be looking at these non-covalent forces as you're pooling on a molecule. And as you're pooling versus time, that's gonna be a distance displacement as well. So that's where you want to understand, is it a long range, short range force, these hydrogen bonding hydrophobic, these specific numbers, or based on the charge, you can estimate, okay, does this make sense about the force applied versus the distance that was actually displaced? So having an idea of those. So any question about scale forces in biology? Now getting into some of the instrumentation, let's get into those uh, specifics. Um, the one that we're gonna go into the most detail about is the optical trap. Um, and you're able to manipulate single molecules attached to beads that are in a trap, that are optically trapped. and you use lasers to do this. Um, so the particles are trapped based on optical forces. So this will depend on the photon flux um, and dielectric differences. So we'll go into this diagram in a little bit more detail, but you can see these vectors are indicating the direction of the light. That's gonna be where your photons are coming from. So that's where the dielectric difference will change um, and cause the light to refract through your bead here. And that exerts, if you're using a laser, if you're using a high photon flux, you'll exert forces um, on there. So you can see this uh, net force diagram. So this is getting back into like classical mechanics of your force diagrams. Um, so it'll be a gradient force that's formed. And this is going to be um, based on the momentum of the photons. So this momentum we can write as P, which would then really be the energy of the photon divided by the speed of light or Planck's constants times um, the frequency divided by the speed of light or Planck's constant divided by your wavelength here. Um, so the momentum plays a role. You also have scattering of the photons as well, and this causes radiation press pressure. And then, like I mentioned in these diagrams, the refraction of the light changes differences in the direction. And then finally, we're even getting into Newton's third law. Um, where equal, the, uh, that you have equal and opposite forces on the particle based on that change in the momentum. So you can see with different amounts, the intensity of your laser light here, that will change in the alignment of these vectors that you can have the net force here would move this trap bead to the left. Here would move it towards the light source. This one would move it away from the light source. So th these diagrams are just examples that you can use this to control the overall direction of your trapped bead with um, high accuracy. Um, 
you need to use, again, like the laser is key, and it needs to be able to overcome um, thermal effects. So that's why lasers are nice, that you can get that high enough intensity um, at a single wavelength. Um, and yeah. So getting into some of the equations behind, I guess, these diagrams, um, also like how you can control um, your optical trap. These include, um, you need to know what your photon energy flux is. And these are the equations that will come into play in the problem set as well. So we describe that as um, with the variable capital E here, and that's going to be dependent on the power of your incident light times small increment of time here. And this is also then related to um, the momentum of the photons. Um, so dp here is the change in momentum or the total momentum of the photons over the time period dt here. Um, so using information about like the total momentum over a period of time, you can then relate this to the optical trapping force. So we're gonna describe that by F here, the trapping force. And this is gonna be dependent on the angle that those photons are coming and hitting your particle and uh, times uh, the total number, the momentum of the photons um, divided by your increment of time. Um, theta here should be close to zero or so. It's typically a few, milliradians. So then you can approximate this equation as the angle um, times dp over dt, which then you can also approximate as based on this equation, the power, so this is capital P, I'm trying to emphasize that, times theta over the speed of light here. Um, so when you're doing a measurement in an optical trap, which are typically measuring is like the fluctuations in this force over time. So this would be F of T. And you can also relate this to physical values of your uh, measurement here and your sample. So these fluctuations in the force over time are related to the stiffness of your trap. Um, the displacement that you see. So the stiffness of the trap will be dependent on how intense your laser light is, the particles that you're using, how solidly it's in there. Um, the lateral displacement is X, so how much you're seeing that bead move. Um, the viscous drag of the solution and then finally the speed that your trapped bead is moving at. Um, you can then use this to describe the motion um, within your energy within the potential here so, um, another important thing is to look at the power spectrum to discuss the frequency dependence of your trap. And this will have a Lorentzian shape. So I show this here in the leaf book. And these equations are all described in that chapter as well, which will help you in the problem sets. 
Um, but if you want to describe the power spectrum for given frequencies, this is going to be kVt over 2 pi cubed um, based on the frequency here squared plus the corner frequency. So this corner frequency has to do with, again, the stiffness of your trap. And this is equal to stiffness over 2 pi times the viscous strap. So that's how this fluctuations in force, some of these parameters, stiffness, the viscous drag, show up in the power spectrum here. Um, and you can see, similar to how you characterize filters with power spectrums, that um, the characteristic, uh, I guess the point where it starts to decay in this power spectrum has to do with um, this corner frequency here. So you can see that guy over here. So these are some of the equations to help quantify uh, how the optical trap is performing, how it's changing over time, and this will be show up in the problem set. So any questions with these equations? And if you're interested in some of the derivations, um, that's all detailed in that chapter six that I uploaded. Okay. Moving on, we can talk about uh, the instrumentation that's actually used. And this is from the literature showing um, a schematic of an optical trap where you can see things in here that are might make you think more of microscopy than forces. Um, but that's because of the optical nature of trapping the bead, but also the optical readout uh, as well. So starting with the source, I've mentioned a couple times that you typically use a laser as a source. And it's very traditional to use a near IR laser. You can see in this schematic that um, they're using a neodymium YAG laser. Um, that's pretty common. Um, and the reason to use an infrared laser um, is, to, is a compromise. Um, it's a compromise between avoiding uh, the water absorption that's further into the UV and uh, the visible absorption of your biological sample. So working at a, a wavelength around one micron is kind of like a sweet spot of avoiding, of having interactions with your sample itself. Um, you can just work with the bead. Um, instead. So you can see here this objective is then used to focus your source or your laser light through a confocal setup. So you're going to have that nice Gaussian profile where you have a highly focused beam um, through the objective. So you typically have to use um, a high NA objective around 1.2 to 1.5. So in this diagram, you can see that they're overfilling the back of the objective. That means it's tightly focused to the spot and it'll be refraction limited to around 500 nanometers. Although you might use a higher power um, that extends and is able to trap more around like two to three times the diffraction limit or so. Um, an important aspect of the source is that you want to be able to steer and control the position. And that's where in the schematic you can see over here there's a lot of uh, optics before getting to the sample and that's where this device here, this AOD is used. You also see beam splitters, that's what the BS stands for. So you can create more than one optical trap by splitting your beam. But the AOD is the important thing here and that stands for Acousto Optical Deflector. And within the AOD, 
is a crystal um, that you can then pass a current through or apply a voltage to. And it creates a grating. That's, and that grating then causes diffraction. So um, by the key thing is you can simply apply a voltage and then change the position of the beam uh, with the AOD. Um, and also not shown in this setup, um, I already discussed it with the beam splitter, an alternative would be a spatial light modulator. And that's like a very fancy type of beam splitter that can split more than a beam into two. It can uh, split into many beams. Um, so you can create multiple traps. Where I'm saying SLM is that spatial light modulator. So this will help if you have more than one trap, you can say like, okay, if you have one bead, and a biomolecule attached to it, that biomolecule will just wiggle around uh, based on it being only fixed to one point. Um, so if you have two beams, you can then have one be fixed and one that you pull and move. Um, if you have multiple beams, you could then increase the throughput of your experiment because the problem with force measurements is you're literally looking at, a drawback is like if you have one optical trap, uh, you can only look one molecule at a time. So it does take a significant amount of time. So if you're able to double that, quadruple it, et cetera, et cetera, you can pull on many molecules um, and get those statistics faster. Um, kind of sticking with this diagram here, um, moving on from the source, also the sample requires um, the optically tracked. So the beads are typically 200 nanometers to two microns in size. Um, they're going to be made of latex, polystyrene, or glass, depending on like what type of chemistry and what type of refractive index that you want. Um, you can functionalize the surface with carboxyl acids amines, um, aldehyde groups. So then you can, this type of chemistry will determine the charge at the surface of your bead and also can allow you to attach biomolecules with different chemistry. Um, the refractive indices of these beads are typically 1.4 to 1.6 and that's going to be greater um, than that of water and you typically use two at a time uh, at the bare minimum. Like I said, one fix, one that you're able to pull. Um, and then for the detector, we're back to optical readouts. Since these beads are quite large, if you're working at the micron scale, the easiest would be a bright field microscopy uh, technique, and that's what's shown here. Through the condenser, you're illuminating this with white light, and you can detect uh, the bright field uh, versus the dark absorption of that of light by that bead. Um, a problem with this is it has slower frame rates. So also um, specialized cameras called quadrant photodiodes or QPDs are sometimes used with optical traps where you can get megahertz frequencies versus bright fields that use CCDs and you might be limited to, let's say, kilohertz or so. Um, and the, uh, the most sensitive type of detector that you can use is also laser interferometry. So this is, um, you can use a secondary laser. And by looking at the interference with the um, 
with your tracked bead, you can then get um, look at that interference in the Fourier domain. And this has high sensitivity. So if you're using a smaller bead, if you're trying to do an optical trap measurement in a more complex solution, uh, laser interferometry can be used. Um, I would say, I also want to point out that most setups are typically home built, um, but there are commercial vendors. So I've shown here Lumix. You can see this is an optical table. I'm guessing it's a three by six optical table or so. And then this is their optical trap setup, which I think is the definition of a black box here. Um, and I don't know the exact price, but I'm gonna guess it's in the upper five figures is my guess. There's more simple ones that you can buy um, like from JPK um, instruments and other vendors that might be more around like 50K. This Lumix setup, you can even incorporate doing single molecule fluorescence imaging with single molecule force with optical traps, and that's gonna push you even greater than six figures, or it'll be in the six figure range there. So any questions about the instrumentation? So let's move on. I do want to mention, um, aside from optical traps, there are other force-based methods. We're going to go into AFM in some more detail, but you can not just use optical trapping, but you can use magnetic trapping. Or you'll also hear optical tweezers, optical trapping, magnetic trapping, magnetic tweezers. And here the bead is doped with some iron oxide in it. And you can see that you would use, instead of an optical trap, you would use a magnetic field to then trap this bead. And you can see, you can also do this similar to optical trap where you have multiple traps. It's gonna be a little bit um, more challenging because it's difficult to disperse uh, multiple uh, magnetic fields here. But you can see here with one trap, you can have your molecule fixed to a surface and pull it from the surface. And you can also do that similarly with the optical trap um, as well. Um, but you have to use a magnetic focus. Um, we can also go back to electro electric forces, like with the nanopores, but you can use an anti Brownian electrophoretic trap. And this is called an able trap. And here you're using um, electric fields from some nano, nanofabricated or microfabricated electrodes. to trap a particle. So that's what's shown here, where these guys are your electrodes that you would machine, or you would fabricate onto a substrate and connect them to some voltage sources. And if you have some feedback, if you're allowed to, if you can apply these uh, voltages um, to create an E-field in the center here, you can trap a particle and keep it there for long periods of time. So you can see if it's just undergoing Brownian diffusion here. You can see something enter and leave and diffuse and leave, just like when we talk about fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. But if you turn the feedback on um, and you're monitoring where this particle is, you can then trap it for long periods of time. So this is very beneficial if you want to look at dynamics that are taking place over minutes, I would say tens of minutes, um, you can trap a particle for that long there. Um, and then finally, uh, you can do atomic force spectroscopy. So we'll talk about atomic force microscopy on the next slide. But atomic force spectroscopy is doing 1D AFM. 
Or you can see here, this is your atomic force tip that you're using. And you have your molecules on a surface and you have to bring your tip down, move your sample around until you find somewhere where your biomolecule is located at. And then you can then move that tip away from the surface to then pull on your biomolecule of interest. And when you see something, uh, let's see, question. So Andy, is your question for um, the ABLE trap or for the atomic force spectroscopy? For the ABLE trap. Yeah, so this yeah. is, Sorry. yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say it's Earnshaw's theorem, right? Because you can't have a stable equilibrium in 3D. Does it yeah. work in 2D? Yeah, so I know that they're doing the focusing just in 2D. Um, so I think the samples are pretty confined to be able to have three-dimensional movement. Um, so yeah, it is in 2D here. Okay, and that's how they're, okay. thank you. Yeah. Writing this down. And I'll have to get it in Shaw's theorem as well. And I'll get back to you on that, okay. So you can see here with the with this force profile here versus the distance of where your tip is from the surface, you can see that you have this constant increase or you have this exponential increase here. When it reaches the extension, you can then see uh, the structure of one of these um, monomers within this protein oligomer here rupture which then decreases the force, and then you can repeat it over and over again. So it is very common with atomic force spectroscopy that you work with like oligomers. So you get multiple measurements with one molecule. But that's pretty common uh, shown here. So getting into detail with the atomic force methods, we're going to uh, we'll talk about how that technique works in 2D, and it's the same with atomic force spectroscopy, uh, just you're leaving your tip at one location, only changing the Z position. So with all these different types of methods that measure forces um, within biomolecules, some example applications include looking at the persistence length. Oh, sorry, Professor Kisley. Yeah. Right before, sorry, it's okay if I quickly ask a question about the last slide? Yeah. Um, so like, um, just like, just, just to clarify, like the yellow molecule, that's the molecule of interest, right? Yes. Okay, cool. Just, right. Yeah, so this here, I can't think of the name of what the like gold standard common molecule that they use uh, for atomic force spectroscopy. That's what's being illustrated here, but it's each of these yellow clumps here, I guess this is kind of small, is an individual protein and it's common that they'll form they'll add a connecting um, strand a random coil between multiple proteins so then when you pull you can see you extend okay you're extending all of those linkers uh, so you have four proteins in a row here within your oligomer four monomers within this oligomer and then when you pull you can then see like okay one of them um, ruptured and unfolded and then if you keep going over time a second one will unfold and rupture so then over the whole course of this measurement you'll get uh, four i guess over here they didn't weren't consistent with their cartoon you would get like four or five measurements of um the force profile those proteins unfolding thank you <laughs> okay. so some applications Persistence length of DNA, so you can talk to uh, the macromolecular science students here, the polymer scientists here, that persistence length is a property of polymers and DNA can be viewed as a polymer. So this relates to the bending abilities and the stiffness of DNA. Um, you can use this to get at the number of domains in a protein. So on the last slide, 
I was showing like a very uh, idealized system where it's very clear like they engineered that to have so many domains. But if you have an unknown protein like I've shown here, you can see okay, there's one, two, three, four, five ruptures within this protein. And that will give you information about the structure and how what forces are involved uh, in the structure here. So just like if we go back to the scale of forces uh, that we discussed earlier, um, this will, the degree that you see here would be related to, okay, this is something that's smaller, that might be hydrogen bonding um, versus something that's stronger with electrostatics or covalent bond or a disulfide bridge might be this guy up here that's relatively uh, strong and stable. Um, People also use this to look at catch and slip bonds between proteins. Um, so if any of you guys are familiar with the research in Mike Hintessi's group in the department, this is what they uh, research. So this would be between proteins. So you can see here, if the blue is representing one protein, the yellow is another. This is could be something like where cells adhere to one another. There's what you would expect for most uh, bonds is the harder, you can see here, this is how long the bond lasts before it breaks based on the amount of force that you're applying to it. So a traditional bond would be, you'd say, okay, the harder I'm pulling on it, the sooner it's gonna break. Um, but there's actually bonds that have been discovered in biology that are called catch bonds, like similar to a Chinese finger trap, you can pull on it, harder and it will actually make uh, the adhesion stronger. Um, so understanding uh, the importance and relevance of those type of bonds. So I'd say check out some of their work or when they give their thesis defenses and talks if you want to learn about that. Um, and it's also been applied to very fundamental uh, aspects of thermodynamics, seeing that, that there's quote, I'm going to say violations of the second law of thermodynamics. Where you can see here with different forces versus distance here, that unfolding and refolding, that there's hysteresis present. And um, this is not expected by the second law of thermodynamics, um, but it has to do with the fact that you're working near KVT um, in biology and with single molecules here, and that there's contributions from non-equilibrium work. And again, I'll point you to the other biophysics course in our department if you wanna learn more about like non-equilibrium work. We won't go into all the details uh, with that. Thing. Okay, cool. Any questions about these one-dimensional force methods then? Okay, so with the last bit of lecture, let's talk a little bit about, um, let's talk about imaging with force, because um, we can do microscopy with force. So atomic force microscopy, um, you're using force to produce an image. Um, and is a, I think a pretty intuitive idea where this tip is gonna be in contact or near with your sample and you're dragging that tip across, you're scanning it across your sample. So your source here is a tip. Um, it's gonna be scanned across the sample. Um, your sample uh, has to be, um, they're typically 2D-ish samples, 3D info, I'd say Z info um, would have to be like on the, nanom on the nanometer scale that you want to resolve. Um, the source or your tip can be scanned in different modes over here based on like how much interaction you want to have with your sample. 
So if you have a very robust sample that you have no worries about uh, dragging the tip over, you can use in the simplest mode, contact mode. There's other, also modes um, based on how far away you keep your tip away, you have different degrees of force. So you can also work in non-contact mode where, or tapping mode. Tapping mode will intermittently bring your tip in contact with your sample, but you're oscillating uh, the tip. And with lock-in based techniques, you can then get an image of your sample out. Um, in non-contact mode, if you're working with a very fragile sample, um, uh, that can be distorted. If you apply force to it, you can use, this takes advantage of Van der Waals interactions here. And you can see above the sample, those vibrations, the magnitude of those vibrations, those oscillations will decrease um, when the sample is present. Um, and then finally, your detector is again using optical inference about what's going on in your sample, that you have a laser diode being reflected off the back of your tip and you're detecting that. Um, so, And where this lands on the photo detector will tell you the position of your tip here. Um, for AFM, some of the vendors include um, Asylum, Antum Par, or Vico. And you'll actually find this equipment more commonly in material science cores. Um, so some of the benefits of AFM, there's an example AFM image here of these are uh, helical peptides um, that are being used uh, to create extracellular matrix materials synthetically. And you can see this dark area, the coloration here is giving you information about the Z position of your tip. So you can see the tip is higher up where these bright yellow areas are, and you can then quantify like the width and the length of these uh, fibers here. So the benefits are that you get high resolutions. Um, these resolutions are going to be dependent on your tip, um, which we'll go over into a little more detail. And you don't need to, no labeling is required here. Uh, so that's a benefit compared to the fluorescence techniques. All these force techniques, you don't require having like a fluorophore label on them. Um, or require fluorescence. Um, so that has less perturbations with your sample. Um, some drawbacks is you have to have a surface. So if you want to image, let's say these fibrils and they're in solution, you're not going to be able to do that. They have to be immobilized on the surface. Um, and the scan rates uh, limit you to typically measuring like static samples. You can get dynamics, but it's going to be on the seconds to minute, it's more around the minute time scale or so. Um, a related technique to atomic force microscopy is scanning tunneling microscopy. Um, and similarly, this uses a tip, um, but it's never in contact with your sample. So if the blue is your sample, the red is your tip here, it's taking advantage of um, quantum tunneling between uh, your sample and the tip. So this quantum tunneling is a low current. And then you can see that like you have to amplify that current to then be able to uh, detect what's taking place at the surface. Um, so this won the Nobel Prize in physics along with AFM since they're both their, I guess, sibling techniques in 1986 and you can get atomic level resolutions with this. Um, the problem is is that it has to be done in vacuum 
You can see this is a home built setup with all the vacuum type equipment. So that limits its applications in biophysics. But it can be used in some specialized cases and I wanted to bring it up since it is commonly brought up at the same time as atomic force microscopy uh, as well. But I would say that STM is pretty much limited to home built setups. Um, and this one is a pretty compact home built setup. They're typically quite large. Um, um, so with that, I do want to wrap up a few side notes as well with practical uh, applications or that are relevant to force. Um, since we've talked about single molecule fluorescence and force, I would say they share the common benefit of removing ensemble averaging. Is what they have in common, but they're looking at very different phenomena. So these communities, uh, I guess they understand each other and the benefits of single molecule, but they're looking at very different things. Like I do single molecule fluorescence when I talk to someone who's doing force or nanopore work, um, they're thinking about very different types of samples and phenomena that they're trying to detect. Um, so, but that's worth noting. And single molecule measurements are taking advantage of the ergodic hypothesis. Um, that means that if you observe enough single molecules, or for a long enough time, it's going to be representative of the ensemble. And if we didn't have this hypothesis, it would be pretty useless to do single molecule measurements. The single molecule measurements aren't imparting some unique phenomenon that's not taking place in the bulk or on average. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to bring up tip artifacts and show that explicitly here, that the quality of your tip in AFM or in STM will determine what your measurement looks out. So this is a wide tip here that's being able to measure a particle or a crevice versus a finer tip here. And you can see that the tip, your measurement is gonna be a convolution of the tip shape and your sample. And there's been whole contentious arguments in the literature of people who are saying they were measuring something very, very unique self-assembly of molecules when it actually ended up being an artifact of their measurement. And like two research groups were arguing about that and the like. So be careful when you're doing AFM measurements or STM measurements that have an understanding of like what you're seeing in your image may or may not be real based on like the tip in your sample. So be very critical of what you're seeing um, and detailed there. Um, and then finally, this figure here is just showing that like all these force techniques we talked about, atomic force spectroscopy, magnetic trapping, optical trapping, you can see they can all measure the same phenomena just with different types of instrumentation. This is all pooling a different uh, DNA molecule here. Um, so with that, um, I'm also going to point you to that chapter six of the leaf book. And are there any questions at all?